yeah, we're going to do our we're going to do our best to keep the pressure on and to uh, you know get a get an answer because so far the answers are have been pretty much no answer and um, they have not responded. Several people have sent emails and they have not responded to any of the emails. So um, yeah, it's disappointing to say the least. And um, we'll definitely keep you up to date on what's happening. We've been off for a couple of weeks. Um, last week, we had a, an amazing rally uh, last Wednesday night. Uh, John came down. Uh, Joyce came down. Um, Randy Miller came down to uh, Culver City for the rally for the hostages. And uh, they had an amazing turnout. They about like six, seven hundred people, I think, right? Five hundred people, at least five hundred. I could, I couldn't tell. I, I would think it's maybe close to a thousand, but I don't want to exaggerate. But thank you, John. John said close to a thousand. I, I think it might have been close to a thousand, but I don't know. I mean, it looked like it was definitely in the hundreds and hundreds of people. It was not a hundred people. It was not two hundred people. No press. KTLA was there and I never saw one thing about it on KTLA, but they were the only network there. I did post, I did post it and I will post for those of you who are on right now, I'm going to post a link to the, um, uh, to the, the full text of uh, the full uh, video text. Rabbi. Full, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is Philip. Uh, we did see the story on KTLA. Oh, they, you did? Of the rally? Yeah. Yeah, they did not do a package, but what they did was they ran the video and then they ran audio of the councilman from Beverly Hills. Oh, no, no, that was the Dodger one. We're talking about the rally for the oh, hospital. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I got Which, no, 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 no. They ran the KTLA thing. Uh, the Our Dodger press release, they did. Which, in all fairness, by the way, and I'm going to say this honestly, was much less important than bringing the hostages home rally. So, of course. Yes, but they, um, yeah, they ran the they ran the the Dodger thing a little bit, much less than we thought, and they um, and they ran. Um, I just posted a link to the YouTube, which is not the full one actually. It's it's my remarks that I gave there, but it's about five minutes. But the uh, Dodger press release actually had more coverage. We had a couple networks, and it also made City News Service, which is why it got picked up. Uh, Spectrum News covered it, and and but I think the Dodgers are are just counting on the fact that it's that it's um it's going to go away. So yeah, and they're just hoping that um they're just hoping that you know people will forget about it by next week. I'm sure that's why they didn't respond. Um, I th I think that's you know. Uh, I'll just show you the article that it, this was, this was the one that the, um, this is the one that the, um, this is the one that the, the uh, city news service ran. And then um, this is the one that, that they ran from city news service. So spectrum and a few other news sources, a few other news sources ran it. So this was on Friday. It's a poorly written article, but it gets the points across, and it actually has the points. It's it's a it's a poorly written article, but it actually is very. Um, it has everything, which was one of my points. Was if you wanted to go to Dodger Day for Jewish Community Day, you had to go to Oakland because they had it in Oakland. They had they had Do they had Jewish Community Day in Oakland, which by the way, Oakland is one of the most anti-Israel anti-Semitic cities in America. I'm not joking. They were one of the first cities to pass it an anti-Israel uh, immediate ceasefire declara declaration. Oakland and and uh, Berkeley, and uh, and so that was um, interesting that even they had it. Even they had it, and and it was it was weird because I didn't even think about it. But we had the we had the press conference on Friday when the Dodgers started a, a three game series against the Pirates, and somebody asked me there. Hey, are the Pirates having Jewish Community Day? And sure enough, the Pirates are having Jewish Community Day on the 27th. The Pirates. So whatever. I mean, it, it just the story gets more ridiculous as, as it goes on because you realize there's no justification for it. So um, anyways, back to back to the Talmud. Um, and it's been so it's been a couple of weeks that we've since we've had class. And 
Today, we're going to read a couple of sections. We're actually, for those that are following in the books, we're starting on, on page 28. There's uh, some discussions in the Talmud about saying prayers, and interestingly, a whole bunch of prayers about a whole bunch of discussions and pages about where you, when you can say prayers in relationship to um, bathrooms. And not just bathrooms, but what if, God forbid, someone has an accident next to you while you're praying? I'm not joking. I mean, this is in the Talmud. So, you know, all elements of life are in that. But there's a discussion off of that, which is that um, uh, we're on 28, page 28B. Uh, That's where we're going to start today. 28B, verse uh, uh, paragraph 3. We're going back to the beginning of the Mishnah, right? So whenever we get a Mishnah section, that's going to be have a capital mem there, and then it's going to have the word Mishnah in the English. So this is the, the actual older text, right? The Mishnah comes first, and then the Gemara is the commentary on the Mishnah. So the original, the, the text that we're starting at, which says the Mishnah, in addition to the Halachot, right, which are the laws related to fixed prayers, the Gemara relates, Rabbi Nehunia ben Hakana would recite a brief prayer upon his entrance into the study hall and upon his exit. They said to him, the study hall is not a dangerous place that would warrant a prayer when entering and exiting. So what room is there for this prayer? He said to them, upon my entrance, I pray that no mishap will transpire caused by me in the study hall. And upon my exit, I give thanks for my portion. And so the rabbi said to him, why do you say a prayer when you go to the study hall? It's not a dangerous place. You're not like saying, oh, thank God I made it in here and out of here alive. It's You're not going to have anything bad happen there. And he said, yeah, but I pray that I don't cause any damage to the students. I pray that I don't teach something wrong. I pray that I don't get in a fight with my colleagues that becomes irreparable because they had arguments. They have big arguments. We're going to see one today. That's what we're really going to read about today. This is this amazing argument that takes place in the in uh, in the Beit Midrash, in the, in the study hall. Uh, that's the bulk of what we're going to read today. But but the guy, the rabbi says, I pray that I don't I don't do anything that causes problems. And when I leave, I thank God for my portion. Well, you know, what is a portion here? What does he mean by felki? That means my portion, right? My portion is, you could understand that as what I've done, the, the things that I've done uh, in there, in, in, in whatever I taught or whatever my place was there. Or it can literally mean just my my life, my 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 portion in this world, my time that I spent today is my can be my portion. It could be a very general term for my portion. It doesn't have to be the portion that I taught or the Torah portion or something. It's it's, not, it's it's almost definitely not the Torah portion. There's a different word for that. I would say parsha or, or I would say the the Torah literally, but it says my portion, which could be again my part of 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 life, my my situation could be my chelki, my portion, my lot. So here's the Gemara. Here's here's the so the 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 gimel mem is the beginning of the Gemara. This is the commentary on it. The sages taught in a baraita upon the complete formula of Rabbi Nechunya ben Hakana's prayer. Upon his entrance, what does he say? So now the Gemara says, okay, we heard he offers a prayer uh, about this, but that doesn't really tell us, you know, we need one a little bit more. What did he actually say? And he said, may it be your will, Lord my God, that no mishap in determining the halakha transpires caused by me, and that I do not fail in any matter of halakha, and that my colleagues who together with me engage in clarifying the halakha will rejoice in me. Right? So he, he clarifies what he, or the Gemara clarifies what he said. He specified, and that I will neither declare pure that which is impure, nor declare impure that which is pure, and that my colleagues will not fail in any matter of halakha, and that I will rejoice in them. So let me do a good job of teaching, and let them do a good job of teaching, and let us rejoice in each other. So even if we have a disagreement, even if we, even if we have differences of opinion, I want to rejoice in them, and I hope they rejoice in me. So you can really see that, again, the clarification on this is, is, uh, is you know, let's, let's, let's do our job right, which is a great idea about doing our jobs, how we go about doing our jobs, the blessings we'd say. But now back to the part of what he said when he left, right? 
What does his lot mean? What is what does he understand is my portion? What does it mean? What's the fold like? What how does the Gemara interpret it? What do they think it means? And th and this is what they said. Upon his exit, what did he say? I give thanks before you, Lord my God, that you have placed my lot among those who sit in the study hall. What's my portion? Right? What's my lot that you've placed me? That's my portion, right? Is studying. And that you have not given me my portion among those who sit idly on the street corners, right? So that's not my portion. My portion isn't sitting out in the streets with people who don't study. So that's my portion. I rise early and they rise early. I rise early to, ma to pursue matters of Torah, and they rise early to pursue frivolous matters. I toil and they toil. I toil and receive a reward, and they toil and do not receive a reward. I run and they run. I run to the life of the world to come, and they run to the pit of destruction. So, you can see what he thought. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is clearly that. And you'll see it. We're going to see another one, too. This one that we're about to read is even more in depth on that. And again, the belief that there is life after death and what the rabbis thought about that and what we're going to see now is, again, we've already seen it in the in the uh, in the parts of the of the Pirkei Avot that we read. That there's a, sen a certain sense of humility we have to have and not being too sure of what that's going to be like. Because look at this next one. And the rabbis recognize it. This whole thing about the world to come, John, is exactly what the rabbis are going to pick up on. That prayer. So on a similar note, the Gemara recounts related stories with different approaches. But again, they're not really different. Well, they're, they're different, but they're unified by this. The sages taught when Rabbi Eliezer fell ill, his students entered to visit him. They said to him, teach us paths of life, guidelines by which to live, and we will thereby merit the life of the world to come. So he's sick. They don't know whether this is it for him. So they want to come over and they want to get lessons. They want to get values and they want him to, to, to teach this legacy. So what is... This goes back to the kinds of things we read about in Perkei Avot. Now listen to this. He said to them, be vigilant in the honor of your counterparts. Which again, the word chaverim mean your colleagues, right? Your friends, your colleagues in study and in life, your peers, right? That's what a chaver is. A friend too, but here it clearly means more of your colleagues. Prevent your children from logic when studying verses that tend toward heresy, and place your children while they are still young between the knees of Torah scholars, and when you pray, know before whom you stand. For doing that, you will merit the life of the world to come. So again, he's talking about uh, uh, what you need to do to get to heaven. Now, There, there is an interesting subtext to this. And again, the translation here obscures it a little bit. The, this, this saying, if you will, of, of Rabbi Eliezer includes a warning about studying outside texts. So he's the translation basically intimates that the issue is studying things that will give you answers that will lead to moving away from Torah. But it can also be understood that you should not have your kids learn Greek and Roman study. They should learn Torah. Is that always study? Uh, some of them seems to some of the rabbis seem to not want to engage in any outside well, studies said, well not just the torah but the the rabbinic commentaries and the midrash and and the other parts of the bible but jewish texts so this could be understood to be um keep your children away from 
from uh, from studying this kind of non you know non Jewish stuff. So this leads some people in the Orthodox world to say, look, if you look at what Rabbi Eliezer says, he's basically telling people to only study Torah. Um, I mean, that is a a possible understanding from that. But even though the children, before they learn studying Torah, they have to learn their ABCs, even back then. Yeah, but yeah, but the but there's a difference between learning how to read and then, first of all, learning Hebrew, and whether you're learning Greek and Roman. And look, it's clear that some of the rabbis learn this stuff, but they definitely want their students, or some of them want their students to definitely avoid non-religious texts, and that exists to this day. There are a lot of people who, who in the Orthodox world, especially the, the more ultra Orthodox world, that do not do not want their kids to learn, uh, spend a lot of time learning science and technology and other stuff. Yeah, it's it's a problem, and it's one of the problems why, in in Israel, the Haredi community or the ultra Orthodox community has a hard time finding. They f have a hard time finding jobs because they really don't have skills. So there are some organizations dedicated to teaching technology to the to the ultra orthodox. And that's what they do. A little bit. A little bit like uh yeah, it's in New York. Kiryas Joel. It's a little bit like that, but it's thousands and thousands of people in Israel. So Israel has a situation where they have public schools but but for students that want to learn in a, in a yeshiva, they can study in yeshiva their entire time sponsored by the government. That There is no private school in Israel. You're, you're either in a public school uh, run by the government or you're in a, you're in a school run by the Orthodox uh, rabbis and they can teach. I mean, there's rules of how they are supposed to teach a certain amount of math and science and they sign up for it, but it's a minimal amount. It's not enough to it's not enough to succeed in Israel, that's for sure. So it's a problem. And these people can't even work, you know, in a low level in in uh, in, in Israeli companies. So it's a problem. Uh, and it's a problem because the, the Gemara, to some extent, sets that up as a possibility for people. It's not all Orthodox Jews. It's really a segment of the ultra-Orthodox who don't feel that it's important to learn anything other than Torah. So you have lines like, this isn't the only place that it's there. Uh, and there are, are rabbis who seem to kind of counter that a little bit, but not, there's no, you need to be well-rounded. <laughs> there's not the text that you want, which is you need to teach your child how to read Greek, for example, or they need to learn logic. The, the Talmud famously says, you need to teach your kid a, a trade, you need to teach your kid Torah, and you need to teach your kid how to swim. Those are the three examples. Now, do you need to be literate to have a trade? Not back then, but today you do. In those days, if you wanted to make shoes or be a tanner or be a herdsman, you didn't have to be literate. Nowadays, to succeed in most jobs, you need to read. You need to be able to do basic math. So one could argue that you're depriving your child of a livelihood um, by not teaching them math and, and science. So it's a problem. It, it's, it's a problem in Israel. It's, it's a problem in some parts of, of America. Uh, New York, not Kyrgios Joel. It's, well, yeah, Kyrgios Joel got into trouble too. But the interesting thing is some of the Orthodox schools in New York got in trouble because they were taking public money and they were not teaching basic, they were not teaching basic skills um, in some of the New York school, New York City schools where the Orthodox uh, live in, in New York. So they had a, they had a problem just recently. I mean, it was, it was in the last five years um, and they got in trouble. I'll show you. Um, uh, so it's an embarrassment and, and people in the Orthodox world who, um, and people in the Orthodox world who, who are not like that, who are more modern Orthodox are embarrassed by it. So, um, 
this is a, I mean, um, I'll show you. This was from, this was from last year. I mean, this has been an ongoing issue. This isn't a new, this isn't a new issue, but I mean, this was from last summer. Um, so these were, this was 18, 18 private schools run by New York City's uh, Hasidic community deprived thousands of students of required secular education in English, math, science, and social studies. So this wasn't out at Kiras Joel. This was in the city. This was in Crown Heights and, and Williamsburg and stuff like that. So, um, so you see, it's, it's, I mean, this is a lot of kids. It's not, this is 18 schools that were involved in this. So, um, so that is, yeah, I mean, there's basic standards that even a private school has to, has to have. And again, some of them get funding or get certain kinds of scholarships or, or uh, grants. So the more that more money they take from the government, the more watch their more eyes are on them. But anyways, that's where this comes from. This problem comes from, emanates from these texts in the Talmud that are not, not great when it comes to um, balance. And again, it's not all Orthodox. It's the ultra Orthodox communities that again, that are promoting this. So another story, and this is a similar story about Rabbi Eliezer's mentor, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who is the guy we've talked about. He lives during the time of the destruction of the temple. He's the one who sneaks out of Jerusalem and establishes the academy at Yavne. He is therefore one of the earlier uh, scholars in the Mishnah. He's, you know, we're talking about 60 years before Rabbi Akiva, you know, generation, literally two generations before Rabbi Akiva and those people. And, you know, a hundred years before, uh, he's after Rabbi Hillel, but he's during the time of the Romans. So he was, he was probably like a little kid when Rabbi Hillel was around and, you know, he's like a generation or two after Hillel, but he's, he's written from, this, this is from a long time ago. And this text is also exactly connected to what John is talking about, which is the world to come. So here's the story. So Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai fell ill. And again, this is a survivor. This is a guy who survived the destruction of Jerusalem and saved, to some extent, Judaism by moving it outside of, of the city. He fell ill. His students entered to visit him. When he saw them, he began to cry. His student said to him, Lamp of Israel, the right pillar, the mighty hammer. That's what they called him. The man whose life work is the foundation of the future of the Jewish people. That's the commentary part, but it's true. For what reason are you crying? With a life as complete as yours, what is upsetting you? Why is this guy crying? And he said to them, I cry in fear of heavenly judgment, as the judgment of the heavenly court is unlike the judgment of man. Remember, the parts in bold are the actual text. The rest is elucidation. If they were leading me before a flesh and blood king, whose life is temporal, who is here today and in the grave tomorrow, if he is angry with me, his anger is not eternal, and consequently his punishment is not eternal. If he incarcerates me, his incarceration is not an eternal incarceration, as I might maintain my hope that I will ultimately be freed. If he kills me, his killing is not for eternity, as there is a life after death that he might decree. Moreover, I'm able to appease him with words, and, and maybe I can even bribe him with money. And even so, I would cry when standing before royal judgment. Now that they are leading me before the supreme king of kings, the Holy One, blessed be he, who lives and endures forever and all time, if he is angry with me, his anger is eternal. If he incarcerates me, his incarceration is eternal, an eternal incarceration. If he kills me, his killing is for eternity. I am unable to appease him with words and bribe him with money. Moreover, but I have two paths before me, one of the Garden of Eden and one of Gehenna, and I do not know on which they are leading me. And will not will I not cry? So you can see that even at the end of his life, after living a righteous life, like a heroic life, he's not sure. 
He's not sure where he's going. You know what's interesting? What? That's sad. Yeah. Uh, you said that you know, they, they, uh, they studied that they, they didn't want them to study Greek or Latin. Or yeah. Gehenna is a Greek word. No. No. It's a Hebrew word. Gehenna is Gehenom, right? It's the Valley of Hinom. Gehenna becomes the Hebrew word for hell, but it is a contraction of two words, Ge Hinom, the Valley of Hinom. The Valley of Hinom becomes for us the embodiment of hell. What's interesting about it is Ge Hinom was a real place on earth. It was on the outside of the walls of Jerusalem was Ge Hinom. It's the Hinom Valley. It was called the Hinom Valley by us or by the people of Jerusalem. Maybe the Jebusites named it that. We don't know. But what, why it became synonymous with hell was because according to the Bible, and we read this in the book of Kings, that is the spot where human sacrifice took place. And for us, nothing could be more abominable than a place where human sacrifice took place. And so Gehenom became synonymous with hell. It's as if, again, today, we would say, I mean, we, we, we don't, but we would say, the example would be, I think one of the examples we would say today is the persons at Auschwitz. Auschwitz became synonymous with hell on the earth. Now, for us, it's also a place where, you know, we were burned and we were we were turned to ash. And, and so, like, it's the worst thing you can imagine. For us at that time, that was the worst thing we can imagine was human sacrifice. But it became synonymous with it. And again, you know, Whatever you want to, whatever you know, the the Jews used to used to say that Sodom, Sodom, was 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 hell, but really that didn't endure. Gehinom, the Valley of Hinom, became synonymous with hell. So Gehenna is the is the is the contraction of those words. Gehinom. It's sad because um, again, for us. You know the 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 path, right? The path to heaven or the path to hell, if if you will. I mean, that's what he's basically saying: the path of heaven, to the path to hell. I didn't, I don't know which one I'm going down. And and and, and so he says, I I I'm crying because I don't know. I'm not sure. Now again, this tells you one of the words, one of the lines that we read in in Pirkei Avot is that we're not supposed to be sure of ourselves until the day we die. We shouldn't be overconfident that the life we led was as good as it should have been. Not that we should be mad at ourselves, not that we should doubt ourselves and say that we're bad people, but there's also an arrogance or a hubris that we might have that, that we're not supposed to have. First of all, he doesn't know that he's dying right now. He might not be dead. But having that humility is so important because How do we how how do we improve ourselves unless we think I have work I still need to do? And so, you know, I don't have to say I'm going to hell, but I can definitely say, gosh, I still have work to do. And by the way, that's exactly where we're supposed to be right now. After Tisha B'Av, which was yesterday, our ideas now we can start start now wishing everyone a happy new year, Shana Tova. We can also start saying to ourselves, how, how do I close out this year? And then the next seven weeks, how do I finish off this year? And that's the way the calendar goes for us. After Tisha B'Av, after this moment of destruction and loss, we think to ourselves, how do we prevent that from happening to our community? And how do we prevent that from happening to ourselves on a personal level? Anyways, so there's a sense of humility that Yochanan ben Zakai has, but it's not over. His students said to him, our teacher, bless us. He said to them, may it be his will that the fear of heaven shall be upon you like the fear of flesh and blood. <laughs> so he says to them, they say, give us a blessing, Rabbi, before you go. And he says, I hope that the fear of God that you have would be like the fear of the, of the king, of Caesar, right? You should fear God as much as you fear, fear, fear Caesar. Now his students, 
His students are going to flip out at that, right? His students were puzzled and said to him, to that point and not beyond, shouldn't you fear God more? Right? He's like, you just talked about, you know, not being afraid of, like, you're not be afraid of a king, but you'd be afraid of God. You're afraid of God. Now you're telling us that we should be as afraid of God as we are uh, as a king. You seem to be diminishing God. So he said to them, would that a person achieve that level of fear? You want more? Just get to that level. Know that when one commits a transgression, he says to himself, I hope that no man will see me. If one is concerned about avoiding shame before God as he is before man, he will never sin. And so he says, <laughs> don't, don't worry. Don't worry about, don't worry about thinking about God like, you know, God, what God knows everything. Yeah, God knows everything, and that's the point. But he's pretty much saying, you're, you're, you're getting all holy and spiritual when I'm telling you, when I'm telling you that if you just assume that that shame that you'd have, that somebody else would know what you're doing, if you just apply that to God, that would help you. Yeah. Just that shame would help you. So, pretty wild. Pretty wild. So, now it's the time for him to die. Which, by the way, we don't know that it's exactly that moment. They came back a couple of days later, came back a year later. We don't know. It does, we don't know. Because the next set, the next line says the Gomorrah relates to the time of his death. And that's not actually there. The next line, I mean, the line begins at the time of his death. Okay, so could have been then, could have not been then. Because it says at the time of his death, immediately beforehand, he said to them, remove the vessels from the house and take them outside due to ritual impurity that will be imparted by my corpse. And they, which they would otherwise contract. So he tells to he tells his students, get my stuff out of the room, get my get my get my uh, personal get the personal effects out of there. Get the vases and get the any food stuff, any of the jars. Get them out of there because otherwise you're going to have to kosher them after I die. Get them out of the room. So he knew he was going to die. That's what they're saying. He knew he was passing, and he tells his students, get get the place ready for me to die. And then he says, and prepare a chair for Hezekiah, the king of Judea, who is coming from the upper world to accompany. He assumed he was coming. Well, at that point, he doesn't say he's going to heaven, but the assumption is if Hezekiah is coming to get him, that he's going to the better, who's going to the good place, or he thought he was going to the good place then, but he at least thought Hezekiah was accompanying him, which is very strange, but it also tells us that something that you've heard before too, which is that when someone dies or before they die, they see people who have already passed. Now, this one's weird because it's King Hezekiah. So where does this even come from? So the commentary on this is that he's a descendant of King Hezekiah, which is possible. King Hezekiah was one of David's descendants. He lived 700 years before, um, actually almost 800 years before him. So it's a long time, actually. I mean, you're talking about from the time of the Assyrian conquest. Hezekiah is the king that the Assyrians almost uh, that they 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 lay siege to Jerusalem during his time, and he survives Hezekiah. So it's it's about 150 years before the destruction of the of the temple by the Babylonians. So it's a long time ago. So he's a descendant, okay, maybe. Um, or again, you know, this tradition that kind of Hezekiah was maybe in heaven already. And one of the traditions is, is that when we go to heaven, we're assigned a team. We have a group. Now Hezekiah is the chief of his group, which is a good idea, you know, nice idea. It's a pleasant idea that we have a team that we're with. Kind of one of the one of the themes in the and I wonder if they thought about that, the TV show The Good Place. We have like a team that we're with in heaven or the next world, if you will. 
Uh, but this idea that there's a a team that we're with and that Hezekiah was maybe the captain of that team. And so your captain comes down and gets you. So that's a possibility. We really don't know. But it's interesting, though, that he sees um, that he sees him. So it's kind of an interesting story. Uh, interesting story. Any comments? Any questions? Any? We're going to read a, a follow-up story to this. But does anybody have a, um, anybody have a story about that? I mean, any questions about that? Oh, nothing. Bless you. Bless you. Uh, bless you. Bless you again. Um, we're actually going to go backwards now. We're going to go backwards. So this we read that a little out of order, but you're going to see why in a second. So we're going to go back to uh, chapter 26b. Chapter 26b. Um, yeah, and the reason is, is that this is from a little later on in the, in the yeah, chronologically in the Talmud, but it's not, it's earlier, it's earlier pages. So we're at 26b verse 5. Um, and we're going to go back and uh, read a little bit about prayer. And then we're going to finish with a story of, of, um, we're going to read a story, um, about how the rabbis interact with each other. But I wanted to get to that story today because of that issue of heaven. And um, it's stuff that we've talked about up until now. We're going to take a little, a little gander at some of the rabbinic teachings about um, prayer and uh, also about how we treat each other in this world, which I thought would be a good lesson today. But I definitely wanted to get to that part kind of going backwards, but we're also going forwards in time in the sense that now we're in the, in the time of, um, of uh, Rabbi Akiva and even beyond that, right up after the temple is destroyed. And I mean, Yochanan ben Zakai lives after the temple is destroyed, but he lives during the time of the temple. Now this is about 50, 60 years later. Uh, what? Uh, well, because uh, that's not that's not the way the Talmud is organized. The, the Talmud is not considered the Talmud doesn't consider dating important at all, and it, it's confusing. And that's why. Look, oh, we're doing Rabbi, this a little. What? Oh, historically, where are we in the years? So we were we were that story took place around let's say 85, 90, 80, 90 of the Common Era. That story from from. Um, Yochanan ben Zakkai, and this is a couple of generations later, though one of the stories we're going to read goes back in, goes back in time. But these are rabbis that are arguing about this stuff a uh, uh, hundred years, or, or in some cases, 50 to 100 years after Yochanan ben Zakkai, the, the rabbis that we're going to be talking about now. Um, where, where are they located at this point? So these rabbis are all in Israel today. Sometimes we'll read... Uh, um, rabbis in Babylonia, but I'll point it out when we get to them. So far, the stories and most of the stories we've read so far in Brachot take place in the land of Israel. Other parts of the Talmud start to deviate a little bit, uh, and I'll point that out when we get to those. When we get to stories that take place in Babylonia, um, interestingly, Brachot, which is the first tractate, really is more based, it, it's interesting that it's, it, and it's not a coincidence, it's really based in Israel more. And so they have not been expelled by the Romans then? Uh, they have. They've been expelled from Jerusalem, but they haven't been expelled uh, from they've been expelled from Jerusalem, but they haven't been expelled from the Galilee. And remember, they're not expelled from the Galilee. There are still Jews living in the Galilee during the Byzantine Empire. They're uh, never expelled from the Galilee. The only time that they get expelled from the Galilee is occasionally, you know, some Muslim prince will take over and expel Jews and they'll leave, but they'll come back. Jews never well, stopped living in the Galilee. There, there are communities in the Galilee that have been living in the same place for over 2,000 years. There's Jewish communities in the Galilee. There were parts of time, like from the time that this was written, where Jews were not allowed to be living in Jerusalem. The reason I'm a, a little confused is because I've been watching that uh, new show on Peacock about ancient Rome, mm -hmm. and they say that Jews were slaves brought to Rome 
to build the Flavian amphitheater, which of course is the Colosseum. And we know that the emperor or the general, Titus, had a uh, his his girlfriend or mistress, I mean his paramour, uh, was a Jewish queen or princess. Well, Joseph, Josephus was living in, in Rome by that point. There were a lot of Jews that lived in Rome, some as slave, some as, as free citizens. Um, but they didn't take all the Jews. They didn't take every Jew out of Rome, uh, out of Israel, uh, and bring them to Rome. There were all, okay, so, most of the most of the Jews were left behind, uh, and they just couldn't live in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, okay, it, Jerusalem was it, destroyed. And and by the way, Philip, my guess is is that Jews continued to live in Jerusalem. Some of them just lived secretly, or the, or the Romans maybe didn't make everyone leave. You know, but there were Jews yeah, yeah. that still lived in Jerusalem. So historically, it is inaccurate for this series on Peacock to say that Jewish slaves built the Colosseum. No, that's true. What, no, that's it true. true. It is okay. true. It's just not all of them. They didn't take okay. every Jew out of Israel and bring them. But there, yes, according to historical sources, the Jews brought built the, the Colosseum. That's what, that's a funny thing is like people say the Jews built the pyramids. Jews didn't build the pyramids. The pyramids existed before they were Hebrews. That's the amazing thing. At least the big the big pyramids, the ones in chaos, you know, the ones in Giza, the the ones that you see in the pictures. Those were not built by Jews. Those were built before Abraham. Those were already old by Abraham's time. Thousand a thousand years old by then. But Jews did build the Colosseum. If you want to see what Jewish slaves built, go to Rome and see the Colosseum. That was built by Jewish slaves. Was every person that worked on that Jewish? Probably not. But 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 much of the work was done by Jewish slaves. Yeah, that is true. It's just not true that all of them were exiled. Uh, many of them were murdered, and many of them stayed behind. Uh, so here's here's uh, a text from that that period. It was taught in a Baraita in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yossi, the son of Rabbi Hanina, and it was taught in a Baraita in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. It was taught in a Baraita in accordance with the opinion. So there's two teachings here. Uh, in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yossi, son of Rabbi Hanina, Abraham instituted the morning prayer, as it is stated, when Abraham came to look out over Sodom and, uh, the day after he had prayed on its behalf, and Abraham rose early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And from the context, as well as the language utilized in this verse, the verb standing means nothing other than prayer, as it says in the language to describe Pinchas after the plague, and Pinchas stood and prayed, and the plague ended. That's from Psalms. Clearly, Abraham was accustomed to stand in prayer in the morning. So what are the rabbis saying here in this text? That ra that They're saying that the teaching of, when, of how we started... Oh, I skipped this part here. Sorry. I was like, I'm missing something here. So here... <laughs> Here's the teacher, two teachings. Sorry, it's in 26 B4. It was stated, Rabbi Yo Yossi, son of Rabbi Hanina, said, the practice of praying three times is ancient, albeit not in its present form. Prayers were instituted by the patriarchs. However, Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi said the prayers were instituted based on the daily offerings in the temple. So there's a difference of opinion of who instituted prayers. Was it before the Jews even had the temple, during the time of the patriarchs, or was it the, during the time of... of um, when the temple stood and the Jews were told when to offer sacrifices. So one rabbi is going to come in with proof text that it was the patriarchs. So here's one. Abraham instituted the prayer of the morning, the Shakrit service. And it says, Yitzhak, it says in the Torah, that Isaac instituted the afternoon prayer, as it is stated, and Isaac went out to converse in the field toward evening. It's a very famous scene. It's when Isaac first sees Rebekah. It's a beautiful scene where Rebekah is on a camel. He, he sees her while he's out in the field in the towards the evening. The rabbis interpreted that, right? A conversation means nothing other than prayer, which it says in Psalms. So the line in Genesis, backed up by Psalms, a prayer of the afflicted when he is faint and pours out his complaint before the Lord. What is a conversation? A sicha in Hebrew? That's a tefillah. Conversation is also prayer. So Abraham stands in the morning. Isaac converses in the afternoon, and that's another thing uh, that tells us that prayer was done by the patriarchs. Isaac was the first to prayer as evening approaches at the time of afternoon prayer. And now, of course, we get to Jacob. 
Jacob institu instituted the evening prayer as it is stated, and he encountered by Yivgah the place, and he slept there for the sun had set. Now the word encounter means nothing other than prayer, as it is stated when God spoke to Jeremiah. And you do not pray on behalf of this nation and do not rise on their behalf. Song and prayer. And do not encounter, tifka, the same root, me for I do not hear you. And so here they take Jacob encountering God, right? He was at that place. And this is the place where he sees the stairway to heaven. And then in Jeremiah, it says the word tifka means encounter, means prayer. So Jacob prayed during the evening after the sun had set. So Abraham prays in the morning, Isaac prays in the afternoon, Jacob prays at sunset, after sunset. So it tells us that our patriarchs prayed three times a day, or they instituted these prayers. And so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob give us the three times of prayer that we, that we pray. So it's a beautiful teaching about when we pray, after, you know, morning, afternoon, and evening, that that's the time that we pray. Um, and then they, there's a long discussion about what time prayers can be offered, uh, the rabbis teach, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, morning prayer may be recited until noon, okay, because the after, the morning offering was, was done in the morning, and then you could do it up until afternoon, because then we'd have the next sacrifice, right? You'd have a sacrifice in the mid midpoint of the day, the mincha offering, that's our afternoon, and then we get into this discussion, but what about the evening time? When do you actually say it? Do you do it when it's sundown, or do you do it and can you do it the whole night? You can do it the whole evening. So they get into a long discussion about that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the Amidah. The Amidah you have to do three times a day. You don't have to do the Shema three times a day. You have to do the Shema twice a day, in the morning and the evening. Yeah, so it's the Amidah, which, according to the rabbis, was instituted by what took the place of the sacrifice, the rabbi said, no, it goes back even further. That's why I just showed you. It goes back to the patriarchs, to our patriarchs. Same text. Yes. Yeah, and by this point, the Amidah is already being done. So, this is all discussion about prayers, about, about doing the Amidah. There's a whole long discussion about how late you can do it. I can go on my app right now. It'll tell me what's the latest time I can do the Amidah for the afternoon. But now I want to get to what do we learn from this? What do we learn from this discussion about the afternoon and evening prayers because we're going to have we're going to have and wow it goes on a long time this prayer this uh, discussion about prayer prayer times you can see they have a very long discussion about this but here's what we're going to get to um, let's get to right here twenty so I'll tell you where we are we're going to continue um, this is all about time this is all about what you see when you're praying. And let's get back to the uh, prayer, this part here. Um, so let's go to this part right here. So, which is uh, 27B13. So it says, the evening prayer may be recited throughout the night and is not fixed to a specific hour. The Gemara asks, what is the meaning of it's not fixed? If you say that one that if one wishes he may pray throughout the night, then let the Mishnah teach the evening prayer must be recited throughout the night. Rather, what is the meaning of not fixed? And it, and it is in accordance with the opinion of one who said the evening prayer is optional. Rav Yehuda said that Shmuel said with regard to evening prayer, Rabban Gamliel says it's obligatory. Rabbi Yehoshua says it's optional. Abaya said the halacha is in accordance with the, the, the statement of one who said the evening prayer is obligatory. Rava said the halacha is in accordance with the statement of one who said the evening prayer is optional. So what they're saying is, is the rabbis were arguing over this for a long time, whether the evening prayer was optional. They're, they're literally saying it went through the discussions between Rav Yehuda and Shmuel, and then it goes with Rabbi Gamaliel and Rabbi Yoshua, and it says that Rava, that even according to here, um, Abaye and Rava, who are, who are uh, colleagues and, and, and debate each other, that it's still going on. And Abaye and Rava both live in uh, Babylonia. So the discussion was going on in Israel, and it's still going on in Babylonia. And now we're going to read the story that we're going to kind of read now 
uh, for the rest of the time. And this is a long story, so buckle up. But this is a really interesting story. Uh, and there's a lot to learn here. There's a lot to unpack in the story. The sages taught, there was an incident involving a student who came before Rabbi Yoshua. So again, it says right here, Rabbi Yoshua and Rabban Gamliel. Rabban Gamliel, you already saw, says it's obligatory, and Rabbi Yoshua says it's optional. And Rabban Gamliel and Rabbi Yoshua are rabbis during the time of the temple. The temple is standing. So uh, Rav Yehuda and Shmuel are even earlier. This is the midpoint. And then this is the last point, Abaye and Rava. So for hundreds of years, the rabbis are arguing over whether the evening prayer is obligatory, whether you have to say the Amidah. 200 years. Well, let's see. So there was an incident involving a student who came before Rabbi Yoshua. The student said to him, is the evening prayer optional or obligatory? Rabbi Yoshua said to him, it's optional. Well, that's what he felt. The student came before Rabban Gamaliel and said to him, is the evening prayer optional or obligatory? And Rabban Gamaliel said to him, it's obligatory. The student said to Rabban Gamaliel, but didn't Rabbi Yoshua tell me that the evening prayer is optional? And Rabban Gamaliel said to the student, wait until the masters of the shields, a reference to the Torah scholars who battle in the war of Torah, enter the study hall, at which point we will discuss the issue. So the guy comes to him before everyone's in the study hall to ask him, right? It's a student. He wants to know. He knows there's a difference of opinion. He wants to know what the rabbis say about it. He went to one rabbi who said it's, a, it's optional, and the other one, Rabban Gamaliel, says it's obligatory. Now remember, Rabban Gamaliel, and you're going to see, is in charge. He's the one who's actually in charge of the, of the academy. He is a descendant of Rabbi Hillel. He's from the Hillel family, the Hillel dynasty, which, which I told you goes from Rabbi Hillel all the way to Judah Hanasi. It lasts for hundreds of years, and they are the power base. And there's more than one Rabban Gamliel. There's three Rabban Gamliels. There's other Rabbi Hillels. There's other Rabbi Shimons that are all part of the same family. They're a dynasty. They literally are like almost like a dynasty. And they are the closest thing to Jewish kings in Israel at the time. They are literally the power brokers in Israel for the Jewish community. When the Roman authorities want to talk to a rabbi in charge, they talk to one of these guys. Okay? They're all, cla they claim to be descendants of, even more importantly, David, right? They're descendants of King David. So they have royal blood in them. And by the way, their family, the Hillel family, continues in Babylonia. And, and after Jews were kind of kicked out after the Bar Kokhba revolt, they go to eventually, a lot of them settle in Babylonia, and they become the head family in Babylonia. They become what's called the Exilarchs, which are the rulers in the diaspora, in the exile. And they, that was a position that the, that, the, that the Persian dynasty would turn to when they wanted a Jewish representative. They talked to the Exilarch. There's almost like a Jewish prince. This family continues to do that for hundreds of years. So Anyways, Rabban Gamliel, he, he's the guy that, by the way, we talk about at Passover. He said, you have to explain the things on the Seder plate. That's Rabban Gamliel. He said, you got to talk about Pesach Matzah Maror. That's the same guy. So he was a big guy. But well, let's watch what happens. So he says, he says to the student, wait till everyone comes in. Have this discussion in public. When the masters of the shields entered, the questioner stood before everyone present and asked, is the evening prayer optional or obligatory? Rabban Gamliel said to him in front of everybody, he already said it, he says it in front of everybody, obligatory. In order to ascertain whether or not Rabbi Yoshua maintained his position, Rabban Gamliel said to the sages, is there anyone who disputes this matter? Rabbi Yoshua said to him, no. I love that. He knows he's now in the academy. And... and, and he says to him in front of everybody, do you disagree? He goes, no. Wait, no. In deference to the Nasi, he, that's the title, the prince, uh, Rabban Gamliel, he did not wish to argue with him publicly. Rabban Gamliel said to Rabbi Yoshua, but was it not in your name that they told me that the evening prayer is optional? He calls him out. He says, "This, you know, I know you're telling people it's optional. I know it. 
He calls him out in front of everybody. Now, he already made him say no, but he doesn't let it go. He doesn't let it go. Think about what, think about in your mind what's going to happen in this scene. See if you're right about what's going to happen in this scene, what, what, what plays out. Rabban Gamaliel said to Rabbi Yoshua, Yoshua, stand on your feet and they will testify against you. Rabbi Yoshua stood on his feet and said, if I were alive and the student were dead, the living cannot, can, the living can contradict the dead and I could deny the, the ruling. Now that I'm alive and he's alive, how can, I, how can the living contradict the living? I have no choice, again, but to admit that I said it. So if he wasn't here, I could say I didn't say it. But he's here. He knows I said it. So he basically says, yeah, you called me out, and I'm not going to deny that I said it. Now, he's already said, I don't disagree with you, but now he's basically been forced to admit that that's what he said. It's not over, folks. In the meantime, Rabban Gamliel is the Nasi, was sitting and lecturing, and Rabbi Yoshua all the while was standing on his feet because Rabban Gamliel didn't tell him he could sit down. He told him to stand. He never told him he could sit. He remained standing in difference to the Nasi. This continued from some time until it aroused great resentment against Rabban Gamliel. And all the, peop all the people assembled began murmuring and said to Chutzpit, the disseminator, stop conveying Rabban Gamliel's lecture. And he stopped. So what's going on here? Chutzpit, by the way, and we read about him elsewhere in the Talmud, his job his speech job, which is kind of weird, was to amplify what the guy was saying. So the equivalent today would be a person signing in front of you. Good speech was either screaming it out loudly, like a megaphone, like that's his job, or perhaps he's translating. We know he's called Chutzpit the, the Disseminator. That's a great title, the Disseminator. Here comes Chutzpit. We know him as the Disseminator. It's like the Terminator. He's the Disseminator. No, he's Chutzpit. The he's the voice, right? He's the he's the voice of the academy. So uh, Chutzpit, that's his job to be loud or to be the guy who's the interpreter. So um, so he may be amplified or translated for it for the guy um there's a wonderful tradition which i'll share with you right now that could speak the interpreter we just read about uh, Rabban, uh gamliel would speak softly and could speak would announce gamliel's words that's a possibility it's also a possibility that he interpreted them uh, it says that he was um, he lived in Sapori in, in Sapori where we visited, and he, that he also had contact with other rabbis like Elazar, um, these other these other rabbis we read about. Uh, according to tradition, he lives long enough to be alive during the Bar Kokhba revolt, during the time of Rabbi Akiva, and according to tradition, he was um, martyred by the by the Romans. They tore apart his body. And according to tradition, which you read elsewhere in the Talmud, that Elisha ben Abuya, the guy that we call Acher, the other, the one who leaves Judaism, that he lost his faith after seeing a chutzpit detached tongue lying in the dust after the murder. And so, again, did he live a long time? Whatever. We don't know, but he would have had to live a long time if he was still alive during this time of Elisha ben Abuya and and, and Rabbi Kiva. So Rabbi Kiva, we know, was murdered. Benina ben Tradion, you know, was murdered by having the Torah wrapped around him. All these people were, were murdered in horrible ways. But for Elisha ben Abuya, the, 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 the text literally says that because he saw Chutzpit's tongue on the ground in the dust, he said, to, he said to himself, if God can do that to somebody who had such an amazing voice, who taught so much through his tongue, and now his tongue's like in the dirt, how can there be a God? Like, he just saw that and it freaked him out. So according to tradition, that's what made him jump. I don't know. It's an interesting 
little thing about Clute Speed. I can't think about that guy without thinking about that part. But anyways, um, so the other people, back to the text, they tell Clute Speed to stop. Cut it out. Turn it off. He's done. Rabban Gamaliel is done. He's humiliated Rabbi Yoshua. He's, he's, he's done. That's when he stopped. It's off. Turned it off. They told Hootspeed to stop talking. So he's talking. Hootspeed's standing next to him, and now Hootspeed's not doing anything anymore. Hootspeed stopped talking. It says stop. They told him to stop, and he stopped. Now, assumingly, that scene was over. The teaching scene of Rabban Gamliel making the guy stand while he's teaching, that's over. But that's not over. The Gemara relates in their murmuring, they said, how long will Rabban Gamliel continue afflicting him? Last year on Rosh Hashanah, he afflicted him. Rabban Gamliel ordered Rabbi Yoshu to, to, to come to him carrying his staff and bag on the day on which Yom Kippur occurred, according to Rabbi Yoshua's calculations. Regarding the firstborn, in the incident involving the question of Rabbi Tzadok, he afflicted him, just as he did now, and forced him to remain standing as punishment for his failure to defend, defend his differing opinion. Here, too, he's afflicting him. Let's remove him from his position as Nasi. So he seems to have this problem with Rabbi Yoshua that he keeps... I mean, we don't even understand the full context of what he's doing to him, but he, he, this is not the first time that he's done this to him. Again, we don't really know the full context of it. They understood what they were talking about here. These other incidents where, again, three other incidents where he humiliated Rabbi Yoshua. And they, and they basically say, he's done. Rabban Gamliel has to be done. We can't let him continue as Nasi. He cannot have the position of authority anymore because he's humiliating this guy. And whatever the excuse is for it, uh, if he did it one time, okay, he made a mistake. But this guy is showing a lack of, of um, respect for his colleagues and is doing it over and over again. And he's not learning. So he's showing that he has completely, you know, has no respect for him. Um, and, you know, he's been doing it multiple times. He did it three other times. So let's take him out. He's done. He's fired. It was so agreed, but the, but the question arose, whom shall we establish in his place? So fine, if we get rid of him, who's going to take over? Shall we ra establish Rabbi Yoshua in his place? So if we get rid of him, th does it make sense to make Rabbi Yoshua, the guy he argues with, who's also very well respected and is on his level to some extent, would we take Rabbi Yoshua and put him in his place? And they say, no. They rejected that option because Rabbi Yoshua was party to the incident, right? He is the other side of this, and then you're, you know, if you take him out, and again, the text doesn't say this, but the elucidation is, appointing him would be extremely upsetting for Rabbi Yo for Rabban Gamil. I'd also say that you're basically saying that we're taking his side, we're taking Rabbi Yoshua's side, and it has nothing to do with what side they're on. It's not Rabbi Yoshua's right and and and. We're not saying Rabbi Yoshua is right now. We're not saying that the argument was over, that the, that the issue was over the argument. The issue is over the behavior. And so we don't want to make this, well, we think that Rabbi Yoshua was right. He can't, he can't be the, the person because he's too close to the incident. He's involved in the incident. We're not going to do it. We're not going to make him. We're not making Rabbi Yoshua. He's, he can't be it. Look at this. Shall, shall we establish Rabbi Akiva in his place? So again, Rabbi Akiva has an issue. Now, this is not in the text, but because there are stories elsewhere in the text that he was a descendant of converts, or if not converts, he did not have, he did not come from a family of Torah scholars. 
So Rabbi Akiva, according to tradition, is either a descendant of converts or not from a very well-respected family. He married into a rich family, right? He married a rich man's daughter, but he didn't have any what we call yichus. He didn't have any any um, any clout. So the text literally says, should we put Rabbi Akiva in? Perhaps due to Rabban Gamliel's resentment, he would cause him to be divinely punished as he lacks the merit of his ancestors. Now, I will tell you that that's not in there. That's the commentary on it. But it literally says perhaps he would be punished as he lacks the merit of his ancestors. It doesn't have necessarily anything to do with Rabban Gamliel. It could under, be understood as he doesn't have he doesn't have the backing um, to protect him to some extent because he doesn't um, he doesn't come from a distinguished family. Now that's a troubling thing because we know how brilliant Rabbi Akiva is, but they're basically saying he could not be the head of the academy because he doesn't have that clout. That's disturbing, right? On some level, that this isn't a meritocracy. That there's a certain level of where you come from here. Now, they can't take the other guy because he's too close to this. This is not. It's not about one scene. Can't take Rabbi Akiva, even though he's very qualified, because he doesn't have the background. And he could get in trouble for it, you know, for not having that kind of background. Puts him at a at a at a at a point where people are gonna maybe other people will 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 take advantage of him because of his lack of 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 yichas of 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 distinguished ancestry. So here's what they say: Rather, the sages suggested, right? They suggested, let us establish Rabbi Elazar Ben Azaria in his place. His outstanding characteristics set him apart from the other candidates. Right? That's the commentary, but okay. He, this is what it says. He is rich, he's wise, he's rich, and a 10th generation descendant of Ezra. So his ancestry goes all the way back to Ezra, the scribe. We haven't really read about much yet, but there's a book of the Bible called the Book of Ezra. Ezra is the person who helps lead the Jews back from the Babylonian exile. So in about 450 of the, of the BCE times, he helps lead the Jews back from uh, under the Persian authority to reestablish Jerusalem. He's one of the most important leaders of Jewish history. Literally, from Moses to Ezra, you're talking about two of the most important people who helped promulgate. And again, Ezra is probably the most famous editor, most important editor of the Bible as we have it. He helped reestablish the community after the Babylonian exile. And so Eleazar ben Azariah is descendant of that. Okay, so he's got yichus. He's got amazing uh, ancestors. He is wise. So if Rabban Gamaliel raises a challenge in the matters of Torah, he will answer it and not be embarrassed. So he's got good ancestry. He's got wisdom. And he is rich. So if he need, And this is what the text says. So if he needs to pay homage to the Caesar's court and serve as representative of Israel to lobby and negotiate, he has sufficient wealth to cover the cost of the long journey, taxes, and gifts. And so what does he have? He has the wealth to have this position too because it requires, it requires dollars to be able to do this. Now, if you think that this is a stupid discussion and makes us feel embarrassed that this is in the Talmud, hello, people. How many people have run for president in the last hundred years, and how many of them have come from very wealthy parentage, and that's what allowed them to be presidential candidates? A good 50% of them. A good 50% of them had uh, great wealth behind them before they ran for president. So... In those days, the wealth was needed to essentially pay off the Romans. That was a part of, according to this, and again, this is in the text, to pay homage to Caesar's court. Pay homage means pay them off. 
Now they included in it also the journey, the taxes, gifts, all that, but it's really paying them off. We need somebody who can pay off the Romans. Right? And he's the 10th generation descendant of Ezra, so he has the merit of his ancestors, and Rabban Gamliel will be unable to cause him to be punished. There's no way he can, whether it's Rabban Gamliel or whoever, no one can claim he has a problem because of his ancestry. He's got good ancestry, he's got wealth, he's got wisdom. And the whole point of this is to establish whether the prayer will be carried. No, it's to be the head of the, it's to be head of the rabbinic, it, it's to be head of the, of the Sanhedrin. It's to be head of the Jewish community. This is to be the representative to the Romans. This is a big job. They've kicked out, Rabban Gamaliel's been kicked out because of his behavior, his behavior to other people. Yes, it's an impeachment. What's so interesting about this is what happens in this story. It's not over. This has so many layers to it, but look, I want you to see all of it because what it tells us here is what they looked at as important job qualifications for people who led the community. And good, good knowledge, good wisdom. They had to be from a distinguished family. I mean, ideally, they had all these qualities, but obviously sometimes people had some and not, not all of them. But they had, um, they had wealth, they had wisdom, and they had uh, good connections. So Elazar Benazari has all these. He's got something missing, by the way. You're going to see it. You're going to see it. He is missing one, one qualification. But anyways, they, so they, but it's, this is such a great discussion. This is such a great part of the Talmud. And it's one that people don't pay attention to a lot. But to me, it's like it says so much about human behavior and what, what, what do we do today? So they came to him and said, would the master consent to be head of the yeshiva? And he said to them, I will go and consult with my household. And he went and consulted with his wife. <laughs> I got to get my wife's permission. This is a great discussion. This is a great discussion. Because again, it shows you how, even in those days, we had to get our wife's permission to do things. He's a good husband. He's a good Jewish husband. So look at what his wise wife says to him. There's room for concern. Perhaps they will remove you from office just as they removed Rabban Gamliel. Who wants this job? They will take you out and, if, and you'll lose your job. He said to her, based on the folk saying, there's a saying, let a person use an expensive goblet one day and let it break tomorrow. In other words, one should take an advantage of an opportunity that presents itself and need not concern himself whether or not it will last. Right? So, yeah. Maybe it doesn't last, but I get to be, get to be the president, right? So but they said, but they just impeached the president. They just got the president. He's like, yeah, but I get to be, I get to be, I get to be the head of the group. Uh, Philip and I were just talking, about, we were texting back and forth today. The, the two jobs in this world today that have the worst job security are being the head of an Ivy League college and being the head of Hamas. Those are the two jobs you don't want to have. Those are two jobs of responsibility. They're like, no, let the next guy have it. I really don't deserve this honor. I really, really pick the next guy. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, it's a it's an interesting phrase that they had this idiom that they had, which was, "I'm going to drink out of the expensive cup. It could break, but I got to drink out of it. I got to drink out of the cup." So, what are you going to do? Not do something because you're worried it's not going to last? Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Now she's she's very smart because she says, 
look at the track record. This is not a job you want because, because they, they, don't, they don't have any, they, don't have, they have no respect for the head. The people who are running this, the show right now, they could take you out. And I mean, that's a smart thing to say. You look at the situation and you say, I mean, seriously, does the next person who's the head of Columbia University, do they want that job? Just, you know, on, a, on another level, more locally, does somebody want, do, do you want to replace Diane Van Hook? I don't. Do you? No. I don't want that job because it's, it, you can be taken out immediately. And arbitrarily. Well, who knows? Like, right, we don't, you know, like, what happens? There's no, it happened behind closed doors. Right. Don't know. Not so, sure. what do you do? He says to his wife, yeah, at least I'll have it for a day. Even if I have it for a day, I got to be the head of the, the academy. I got to be the head of the Sanhedrin. So she says, but you have no white hair, which is another way of saying it's inappropriate for one so young as you to head the sages. Now, that's a great point, too. He doesn't have the age. The, yes, you don't have, you don't, you don't have that. You don't have that, uh, you don't have that, the air of, of wisdom about you. Now, here's the interesting miracle that happens. That day, he was 18 years old. Well, that definitely, he's not, does not have the uh, competence of the wisdom, the, the time, the maturity, right? But a miracle transpired for him, and 18 rows of hair turned white. <laughs> so his hair turned white right away. So his wife said, you don't have any white hair. Got white hair. I don't know if he was 18. I mean, the Talmud says he's 18 because he was really young. The Gemara comments, that explains why Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria said, I am as one who is 70 years old. And he did not say, I am 70 years old because he looked older than he actually was. So he went gray according, or went white according to the Talmud because he had to in order to get the job. He had to look older and he looked older. That phrase, by the way, is in the Haggadah. So when you look at the Haggadah next, you can look at the you can look at your Haggadah. When they have a discussion, they they quote Rabbi Elazar Ben Azar. We actually read this text, by the way, in Brachot, when they discuss about Passover, right? Why does the Passover say, why does it say in the Torah, Kol Hayom, right? We 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 read about the Exodus uh that it, that it was throughout the day, uh uh through, throughout the our days. And um the the rabbis on one hand say it's because it's the days and the nights. And then they say, well, no, it's for this world and it's for the world to come. We're going to be talking about Passover, if you recall, the, the redemption, not just in this life, in, in this world, but even in the next world. Even when we're redeemed from the world we live in, we're still talking about the redemption from Israel, from uh, Egypt. So that's the discussion. And according to tradition, Elazar ben Azaria says, I was one like seven years old. And he did not say, I am seven years old. So he says, I am like a 70 year old man and the reason that he says i'm like a 70 year old man is because he was very young when he said it but he looked older so he that's the one thing he was missing he was missing age he was missing his age his, his, he wasn't old enough so um so he had the other qualities but he didn't have the age it was taught on that day, they removed Rabban Gamliel from his position and appointed Elazar ben Azaria in his place. There was also a fundamental change in the general approach of the study hall as they dismissed the guard at the door and permission was granted to the students to enter. What does that mean? According to tradition, right? Instead of Rabban Gamliel's selective approach that asserted that the students must be screened before accepting them into the study hall, the new approach asserted that anyone who seeks to study should be given opportunity to do so. As Rabban Gamliel would proclaim and say, any student who's inside, his thoughts and feelings are not like his outside, that is, his conduct and his character traits are lacking, will not enter the study hall. So they, they're, they're, so Rabban Gamliel, in addition to sometimes humiliating his colleagues, also had a very high standard for who he led into the room. Now, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? 
Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Now, based on what they just said, they seem to be saying it's not such a bad thing. Because what he's saying is, is that um, the person who comes in needs to not only behave well, but has to has has to have um, um, he has to have good motivations and good thoughts, but he also have to he has to have good actions, and um, so his thoughts and feelings have to be good, and his outside behavior, what he actually does, has to be good. So he had a high standard, but he, according to this, when Elazar Benazario is in charge, he just said, open it up. We let everybody come. So this is an interesting, another discussion. Yes. I mean, this is obviously a question about the angel being a gatekeeper, mm -hmm. and it should, but this doesn't even sound like Gamaliel's idea was good because we can't verify. No, because the thing is, I think oh, his thoughts, like if his thoughts and feelings, at least in this translation, are saying anyone who studies Torah but does not possess fear of heaven, you can't check that. No, but you the, can't gate the perspective. Well, it's tough, but it does require people to well, work work very hard to get in. You, but, but even by that definition, you can't check that. Like well, people today who spend years in Studying, so studying all religions and there are the gates. So I, I understand. No, you're, so you're you're saying how do we know what someone's thoughts and feelings are? Can't actually check the people you're letting in at the gate. Well, assumedly, assumedly there was some process of screening that went on that would eventually allow those people to come in. So how did they do that? They would have to prove that. So, so let's just say, for example, like, how do they tr how do they do that? You know, it's like you know, like in kung fu, where the guy has to hold the the, the has to hold the the hot thing of coals with his hands, you know, and has to prove that he can grasp that stone out of out of his hand. <laughs> you know, that's how he knows he's ready. The the it is a tough one, right? Because it's not just about the way you behave. So what they what they what they're literally saying is we have to somehow be able to judge whether the person's intentions are based on are they acting this way because they just want to look like they're following the rules or are there are their are their intention behind them is it good so that requires understanding them and really knowing them at a level that requires some 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 work and it and it and it's hard because how do you do that it definitely requires getting to know the person and, and maybe having conversations with them enough, not just about whether they're following the mixed vote, but um, but understanding like what's their motivation, right? And that's what they're really talking about is what's their motivation? Because if we just look at the way they act, if their insides aren't matching their outsides, well, they look okay. They seem to know how to do the prayers, but are they actually doing them for the right reasons? And so they really want to make sure that the people do that. Now I'll give you an example. Like, and this is a legitimate example. Every rabbinical school in America that I know of that's actually an in-person legitimate rabbinical school has a psych evaluation before you go, before you, before you, um, before you're accepted. You have to pass the psych evaluation. And uh, it's not, it's not an easy thing from the standpoint of, you know, you know, I had to go through a psych evaluation and and uh, I'll never forget it because I, I walked out of that psych evaluation going, there's no way they're ever going to accept me into the school because I, like, I got trapped in, and it was, I mean, they, you know, I was honest, but I got trapped. And, and I, and I also wonder like, look, that's, that's what you have to do. Look, there's a, there's a, there's a test. There's a, what's called the Wonderlick test, which they give to NFL players before they are, well, question of whether what they do with the wonderlick test but the test is supposed to be able to test your emotional intelligence and your emotional iq of whether you can function on a team and whether you're you know going to be a, a good quality citizen on the team obviously they, obviously they don't always follow it but a lot of it is intelligence but it's also supposedly the wonderlick test is supposed to um you know find 
people who are going to have some aberrant behavior, but it's very hard. So there's not really a test. You have to have conversations with them. And again, some of that happens over time. And, and again, then there's the question of what, what do we do with that knowledge? Whether we actually tell people hey, you're not, yeah, you're some, there's something off. Um, but um, yeah, nobody wants to ask me what I said to the psycho psychologist that made me question whether I was going to get in. I'll tell you, let me tell you what it was. So I, I, I was going to school, I, I was going to seminary in New York and I had to go uh, to New York to uh, do the interviews and to do the, the to the, to the psych uh, meeting. And uh, I, I promise you, this is like, it was, the whole trip was so stereotypical. I went to the woman's office. She had an office on the Upper West Side. And it literally was, she, she was like the Barbara Streisand character from, uh, you know, from what's it called? From the movie, what's that movie? Uh, movie where she plays a psychi the psychologist. Come on, the one with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, no, the one with uh, she is that in, in that too. No, the one where she's the serious one. Nick uh, Nolte. Yeah, Nick Nolte plays the the writer. It's a, it's right. based on a true story. Whatever. She's a psychologist. So this woman was literally that New York Jewish psychologist. Uh, and and I had been to New York very little in my life before I went to school there. I didn't have family in New York. I didn't I didn't have a lot of interaction with New York. And I was really not looking forward to going to seminary in New York. I have to be honest. I was not. I, I, New York gave me a lot of anxiety. I mean, I just like, just the whole energy there was not something that I was used to. I didn't find Prince it. Prince of fun. Tides. Yeah, Prince of Tides. Thank you. So she was literally out of Prince of Tides. So I, so we're talking about, she's interviewed, you know, she's talking to me, she's asking me questions. And I was honest with her. She said, do you have any, what's your biggest, what are your biggest fears or anxieties about going to New York? Like literally, and I mean, I, I, I think I might've said that and that's why she followed up with that. I don't remember exactly how he said it. I said, look, I said, there's a certain intensity in this city that I'm just not used to. I grew up on the West coast. I, I, you know, there's a stereotype that we're a little bit more relaxed and a little bit, you know, more chill. I don't say the word chill back then or whatever, but I said, you know, there's a certain intensity here, which, which makes me uncomfortable. And she said, so she started pushing that button. She was like, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, there's a certain kind of like uh, aggressiveness or pushiness that a lot of people have, even even the Jew, even and maybe even especially within the Jewish community that makes me really uh, un uh, sometimes uncomfortable. She says, what do you mean? And I go, like, exactly what's happening right now. <laughs> so, so, so I, literally, I literally was like, this woman hates me now. He's not only... Not only did I say New Yorkers make me uncomfortable, but you make me uncomfortable. And this is exactly why I don't like New York because there's pushy people like you that make me uncomfortable. So I'm like, oh, I just literally people in New York, you know, I can't, I can't catch a break. And, and uh, alternate, alternate side of the street parking and the whole bizarre thing. So I said, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I walked <laughs> I walked out. Yes, I walked out. I told Tracy, I said, yeah, I think that's, I don't think I'm going to New York. Um, so I was like, there's only Cincinnati. It was the only place left for me. But I, uh, it turned out it was okay. But but uh, I think she said something to me like, or she didn't say it to me. Maybe she said it to me or it got back to the seminary. It's like, you know, you sound like you're anti, sounds like you're anti-Semitic. I said, I didn't say that. I said, I said, New York Jews make me uncomfortable, but all New Yorkers make me uncomfortable. It's not just the Jews, but yeah, whatever. I was like, and the guy who, the guy who was the head of the, the, or the Dean, not the head, but the Dean of the seminary was actually an English Jew who kind of understood what I, he was very English. And he was like, I know, what you, I know what you're talking about because he was English. And so he understood that, you know, there's an intensity to New York, but anyways, yeah, that's a true story. I'll never forget it. I was like, oh, I just kept stepping in it. And uh, it's exactly what I'm talking about. So yeah, it was a Talmudic story. But anyways, the point is, is that yeah, we try seminaries try to um, try to uh, evaluate people, but it's hard. You know, a lot of times uh, the students are already in, and then you have to pull them aside and say, hey, I don't, you know, I don't think I don't think this is the right place for you. I will tell you that later on, I was um, 
when my seminary first opened up a West Coast campus about 20 years ago, they put me on the admissions committee, and I felt pretty un I pr I felt pretty uh, unqualified to do it because at the time I was like in my young 30s, and I was like, I I, I shouldn't be evaluated. And these were people that were in my age, and most of them were older, that were coming into rabbinical school because there's more and more people. It's a second career for them, and um, and so I felt very uncomfortable evaluating people that were older than me. But I, I was put on the, the committee originally, and I, I pretty much told him, I said, I, I'm honored to do it, but um, I felt like Elazar Ben Azari. I felt like I didn't have enough white hair to be doing this evaluation. And I'm not very good at evaluating people. I, I tend to give everybody a pass. I don't like, I don't like uh, judging people. And so I, um, I was not a good person for that because I don't I, I don't want to. I'm, I'm like this guy, Elazar Ben Azari, who said, yeah, everybody can come in. You know, we'll figure it out later, but you know, it's probably not a good idea. And so this resonates for me as you're going to see what happens with this story. So, um, yeah, I was a horrible, I think I, I think I maybe let everybody, I, I can't, that's why I can't watch those shows like America's Got Talent. I hate those shows, American Idol. I can't, I don't like people evaluating other people. I don't watch, I've talked about this before. I don't watch beauty pageants. I don't like evaluating people. I was a horrible rush chair. I let everybody into the fraternity. When I was in charge of rush, <laughs> they were they would I was like, stop that. Just they're into they're they like everybody has a good quality. How can you say this person can't come in? It was just, it was horrible. I don't like evaluating people. So I was not good at it. So I'm like Elzar Ben Azaria. Because look what happens. On that day, several benches were added to the study hall to accommodate the numerous students. Rabbi Yochanan said to Rabbi Yosef Ben Dostai. And the rabbis disputed this matter. One said 400 benches were added to the study hall, and one said 700 benches were added to the study hall. When he saw the tremendous growth in the number of students, Rabban Gamaliel was disheartened. The old guy, right? He said, perhaps, heaven forbid, I prevented Israel from engaging in Torah study. So maybe I screwed up because I had too high of a of a boundary to let people in. So he was feeling terrible, like screwed up. They showed him his dream in a dream, white jugs filled with ashes, alluding to the fact that the additional students were worthless idlers. So he has a dream, and it turns out the 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 jugs are filled with trash, the trash. But the Gomorrah comments, that is not the case. But that dream was shown to him to ease his mind so that he would not feel bad. So they're saying, no, he was wrong, but they didn't want to make him feel bad. Yeah. 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 Then we have this uh, generic statement saying they, right? The students. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. They don't identify who they are, mm -hmm. right? Except for the elders and leaders. But these guys are obviously elders and leaders themselves in their own right. So there was actually a level above them, right? Am I missing something here? No. Well, no, the elders, the, 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 the head people, the, the head guys are the head guys. See, yeah, they're the head guys. They're the older, they're the old guard. They're the guys who can remove a guy. Yeah. Yeah. So they're all part of the state. Yeah. They're all fighting. That's yeah. How they're, 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 yes. It's not over. It's not over. It's not really what it was about. It was about the way he treated. Rabbi Yoshua. Rabbi, yeah. yeah. The first part was, uh, he, 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 he made him stay. Yeah, but. I understand. That was later down. Yeah, but so, so they, so it wasn't, it wasn't that he gave a bad decision. The, 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 the rabbis never, they haven't got, well, they definitely are on Rabban Gamliel's side. We know that the evening prayer is obligatory. We know that. That's why we still do the Marif service thousands of years later. So there's no question that they take Rabban Gamliel's side. They know he's right. But they're also saying it doesn't even matter because of the way he treated Rabbi Yoshua. Because there's something wrong with this guy, 
And he clearly was, even though they want to say he was thinking that he was trying to uphold a high standard, the guy was cutting people off. This is a lesson for everybody. This is a lesson for every other rabbi that's going to be in a position of power. So more students showed up to show support for... They, they showed up because they had a chance to come in. Because they said, oh, wait a second. You mean you've taken away that requirement? We don't have that requirement anymore? It's like saying, hey, you don't have the SAT anymore? I'm going to apply. And 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 so they're saying, well, maybe there's something to be said for lowering the the bar so that not that not that anybody could get in, but that more people can get in. Maybe again, there's a standard, but your standards were a little were a little uh, beyond above and beyond because you were actually cutting people off. So again, they don't dislike Raban Gamliel. They're not happy with the way he treated people, and they they know that he maybe is well intentioned, but there's something wrong with him. It's not over. I'm just telling you, it's not over. So so again, you know, Raban Gamliel maybe feels a little bit better uh, on, on his standards, but it's not over. So now it says, uh, it was taught. There is a tradition that the tractate Eduyot, which is a tractate of the Talmud, was taught that day. And everywhere in the Mishnah or in Abraita that they say on that day, it is referring to that day, right? Well, maybe that's, maybe that's saying that was a big day when that happened. There was no halakha whose ruling was pending in the study hall that they did not explain and arrive at a practical halakhic discussion. And even Rabban Gamaliel did not avoid the study hall for even one moment as he held no grudge against those who removed him from office and he participated in the halakhic discourse in the study hall as one of the sages. Now, I don't like that commentary because that's not really what they're saying. What they're really saying is Rabban Gamaliel knew that what was going on in the study hall after he was no longer in charge was really good stuff. The discussions that they were having after he was gone was really good stuff. They explained everything. They got to the bottom of the discussions of the disputes and they put in, you know, the 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 work. They did the work. They they had the discussions, they had the disputes, and even Raban Gamliel didn't sit it out. Now, they say it's because he didn't hold a grudge. I think the point is is that he knew that there was such good stuff that was going on there that he couldn't stay away. Now, regardless of what you're going to say right now that fact that he didn't the fact that he didn't walk away angry and say well i'm never coming back now because you took me away from my job is something that you need to understand because it shows you that even raban gamliel who clearly has some faults understood that his job as a rabbi was not to take this stuff personally he shouldn't walk away from the community and from the place that he worked, even though he's no longer in charge, which takes a whole lot of, it takes a whole lot of, of integrity to do that. Hold it, hold it. Well, <clears throat> he's still one of the sages, but hold that point. Cause you're going to say like, what happens here? So, so, he didn't walk away. He didn't walk away and say, I'm done with these people. That's a really, really important concept. It's something that very few people have been able to do. And again, some people do it because they have so much power. They have so much vested interest in the situation that it's like, they're not going to walk away. Right. So, and they also think, of course, they're going to come back into power. Right. Some people walk away. Some people walk away. Like I got treated like garbage. I'm I'm out of here. I mean, again, some people they got way too much power. They don't want to walk away from any of that power, right? Nancy Pelosi didn't walk out when she got thrown out. Now, again, maybe she's hoping she'll be Speaker of the House again, but I don't think so. I mean, it looks like Hakeem Jeffries is going to be if if they take control of the Democrats, she ain't coming back. Now, would she stay in? I think I don't think she'd leave. But she's not. She. I don't think she's ever going to be Speaker of the House again. Um, Mitch McConnell didn't leave the Senate when he was bounced out. He stayed in. Kevin McCarthy walked away. I'm done. Walked out. Walked out of his congressional seat. 
got out of Congress. He's like, you know, I'm not going to get treated like this. He walked away. He walked out of his job. He didn't even finish his term. So people respond to this kind of stuff differently. It takes a certain kind of person. Now, again, you know, maybe some people are so craven and so, you know, so connected to the power and to the money that they get from a position like that, that they want to keep it. But you can make more money out when you leave Congress. It's not like that's the end of your money. You can maybe make more. But it's an interesting thing because we see it in our own life. I, I will tell you, one of the things I'll never forget, I'll never, ever, ever forget it, and I'm going to say it because I've said it publicly, and I'm going to say it now because this person has served in our temple for many, many years. But when I came to the synagogue in 2000, which I just celebrated my 25th anniversary, um, Rosemary Watson was president of the temple. And I came here in June, and... Uh, they had, uh, I, I started, you know, the process of, of coming here, though, in March. I, I did a, the first thing I did here was a Passover Seder at, uh, for the temple. Even before I was hired, I, I did that. It was kind of like my trial. And so then they hired me, and then I officially started in June. In July, they had the congregational vote. And Rosemary Watson was bounced out of power. They had a board that was in power. And there was a whole slate of officers that were run against the current, the people who hired me. And the entire slate of officers of the challengers who were all had previously been on the board and didn't like the, the direction that the board was going. The board was not doing anything wrong. They were just trying to bring the synagogue into its next iteration and move away from the way it was. And the people who tried to take back power, they all lost with the exception of Rosemary. The president of that group became president. Everyone else left on the board was Rosemary's board. Rosemary lost, I think, according to tradition, by one vote. But she was bounced out. She was no longer president. I was now left with a different president than the one who hired me, which created a very awkward situation. But the rest of the board stayed on. The rest of the board was voted in. The only person who, who didn't get on, on that slate was Rosemary. But she didn't walk away. I, I don't know that I wouldn't have walked away. I don't know that I would have said, I'm out of here. This place is insane. I mean, I, you can imagine how I felt having a board where there was two alternate slates of officers that were run against each other. But that's what I came into. And uh, I'll never forget the fact that Rosemary had the integrity and the, and the personal qualification of, of having uh, being able to subdue her ego enough to say, you know what? I'm not walking away. I'll never forget that. Um, and that's one of the reasons I admire her is because I don't know I would have had the strength to do that. I don't know if I would have been able to sublimate my anger at some of those people and, and not walk away, but she didn't. And she persevered and she came back and she served as president again. And she served on the board many times after. But keep that in mind because, again, those things happen. Those things happen. And sometimes they're national importance and sometimes they're of local importance anyway so let's see what happens to these guys so Raban Gamliel keeps coming back and it shows that he has some integrity right it shows that he has some fortitude as we learned in a Mishnah on that day Yehuda the Ammonite a convert right he was an Ammonite convert came before the students in the study hall and he said to them what is my legal status in terms of entering into the congregation Right? Can I marry a, a Jewish woman? Because it says in the Torah, Rabban Gamliel said to him, you are forbidden to enter into the congregation. Rabbi Yehoshua said to him, you're permitted into the congregation. Oh. Rabban Gamliel said to Rabbi Yehoshua, wasn't it stated in the Torah? It says in the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, an Ammonite and Moabite shall not enter the congregation of the Lord even to the 10th generation. Right? Even to the 10th generation shall none of them enter into the congregation of the Lord forever, right? So the text that he quotes back to him is the Torah that says an Ammonite and Moabite cannot come in. Now, by the way, Ruth was a Moabite. Her great-grandson was King David. So somehow <laughs> this had happened. So how can you permit him to enter the congregation? And Rabbi Yoshua said to Rabban Gamliel, do Ammon and Moab reside in their place? 
Sennacherib, the Assyrian conqueror, right? The king of Assyria came and through his policy of policy of population transfer, scrambled them all up. All the nations are mixed up. And he settled other nations in place of Ammon. Consequently, the current residents of Ammon and Moab are not ethnic Ammonites and Moabites. As it is stated in reference to Sennacherib, it says in Isaiah, I have removed the bounds of the peoples and have robbed their treasures and brought down as one mighty the inhabitants. So it says in the Bible, later on in the book of Isaiah, that the Assyrians messed everything up. They mixed everyone up. And although it is conceivable that this particular convert is an ethnic Ammonite, nevertheless, there is no need for concern due to the halakhic principle. Anything that parts from a group of parts from the majority, and the assumption is that he is from the majority of nations whose members are permitted to enter the congregation. So even if he has some Ammonite blood in him, it's only a part of who he is, and so the rest of him is good. <laughs> and so maybe he's part Ammonite, but he's not full Ammonite. We don't have any full Ammonites anymore, and that is true. By the time of the Roman period, there is no one walking around saying they're an Ammonite. There's no one walking around saying they're a Moabite. There are people who are still walking around saying they're Edomites. But the Moabites and the Ammonites, there's no longer anyone saying that they're that. And so this guy is okay. So Rabbi Yoshua is, is obviously is more liberal than Rabbi Rabban Gamliel says that this guy is okay. We don't have a problem with this guy, right? Rabban Gamliel said to Rabbi Yoshua, but wasn't it stated, right? And, and also, again, in the Bible, in Jeremiah, but afterward I will bring back the captivity of the children of Ammon, says the Lord. And they've already returned to their land. Therefore, he can be an ethnic Ammonite, and he may not convert. So in Jeremiah, it says that these people are coming back. And they're all going to come back. These different groups will come back. So Isaiah said it, but Jeremiah comes after him. And so Jeremiah seems to be talking about Ammonites. Rabbi Yoshua said to Rabban Gamaliel, that is no proof. Wasn't it already stated in another prophecy, from the prophecy of Amos, and I will turn the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall make gardens and eat fruit from them. And they have not returned. In rendering the ruling, only proven facts may be taken into consideration. They immediately permitted him to enter the congregation. This proves that Rabban Gamaliel did not absent himself from the study hall that day and participated in halachic discourse. What happened? Rabbi Yoshua's proof from Amos is taken as, um, look, we're, we're, we're here. Uh, Amos says that we're, that the prophet Amos says that the captivity is over, and all this stuff is, is done. All the old rules as far as who's an ethnic person, we don't know them anymore, and we're all here now. The guy's okay. But that's not even what the rabbis are saying. They're saying that that discussion proves that Rabban Gamliel was still debating his old rival, Rabbi Yoshua. The whole purpose of that, well, there's two purposes. One to show Rabban Gamliel is a little hard-headed and a little difficult in his rulings. He's a little stringent, maybe too stringent. But more importantly, it shows that he's still debating. He's still there. He's still having discourse. Right? Now, here's what happens after that discussion. So again, Rabban Gamliel is still debating people. He's still debating Rabbi Yoshua. But look what happens here. This is why I wanted to teach, to read the story today. It's a big story, I told you. A lot of stuff. Rabban Gamaliel said to himself, since this is the situation that the people are following Rabbi Yoshua, apparently he was right. Therefore, it would be appropriate for me to go and appease Rabbi Yoshua. So he says to himself, gosh, Rabbi Yoshua, maybe he's right about things sometimes, right? He was pretty sure of himself, Rabban Gamaliel, and now he's not so sure. And he knows he's been deposed of power. So what does he do? He finally does something pretty wild. Maybe he should have done a long time ago. He goes to Rabbi Yoshua's house. 
and he saw that the walls of his house were black. Rabban Gamliel said to Rabbi Yoshua in wonderment, from the walls of your house it is apparent that you are a blacksmith. As until now, as until then, he had no idea that Rabbi Yoshua was forced to engage in that arduous trade in order to make a living. Rabbi Yoshua said to him, Woe unto a generation that you are its leader, as you are unaware of the difficulties of the Torah scholars, how they make a living and how they feed themselves. It finally dawned on Rabban Gamliel that he was not a good leader because he had no idea of the poverty that Rabbi Yoshua was living in. And he said, Woe to this generation that you are its leader. Like, he finally, it finally hit him that he wasn't a good leader. Well, I understand about leadership. That I understand. Yeah, but the, but the, but you understand that his he he didn't know that the guy was working had a had an outside job in order to support his livelihood so he could study. Rabban Gamaliel is from a rich house. Rabbi Azaria El Elzar Ben Azaria is from a rich house. These some of these guys had money. This guy didn't have money, and he's been his colleague, and he's been arguing with the guy. He never thought to himself, what does this guy have to do to make a living? He didn't care. He wasn't even, he says, I wasn't even aware of it. I didn't understand it. I couldn't, I, I like, I've been living in a completely oblivious to how people are actually living. He only sees it by going into the guy's house, right? He couldn't, he, he didn't know. So uh, I, I understand that he makes a difference. What? Because he he was not Rabbi Rabbi Yoshua is a working man, and he didn't even realize that Rabbi Yoshua is a working man. So he he has he has but he has so he has no awareness of what people are dealing with. He doesn't realize what people look. It happens, you know. It was it happens it happens with. Look, do you know why some people say that George? Bush Sr., H.W. Bush, lost an election because he walked into a grocery store and didn't know that there were scanners in the grocery store. Oh, wow, look, there's scanners. People were like, seriously? And people were disgusted by that because they knew that this guy who was raised in immense wealth had no clue of how people were living. Didn't even know about buying groceries. He couldn't understand. He couldn't understand it. So this is a problem that the guy had. And he wasn't a good leader because he didn't understand it. And he says, he finally understands, I screwed up that humility. Now look what happens. Rabban Gamaliel said to him, I insulted you, forgive me. Rabbi Yoshua paid him no attention and did not forgive him. He asked him again, do it in deference to my father, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamaliel. So you can see that his father was, was Rabbi Shimon and his father was Gamaliel. So this is Gamaliel II who was one of the leaders of Israel at the time of the destruction of the temple. And he was appeased. So he, so he says to him, please forgive me. And he goes, get out of here. He goes, do it, don't do it for me. Do it for my father, who was a hero. And then he's like, ah. So you can see that people respected you for who your family was. In some cases, again, it, it achieved you know, this, this forgiveness that he had. Now that Rabbi Yoshua was no longer offended, this is the kicker, my friends, it was only natural that Rabban Gamliel should be restored oh, to his position. Oh God. You didn't see that one coming, did you? You didn't see that one coming. Because in our world today, this would never happen. They said, who will go inform the sages? Right? Who's they? Who, like the, the John's right. There's people making the decision, and then there's the rest of the people who are going to go along with the decision. So there's sages, and then there's sages, right? There's the people who are really the power people. So who, we, we decided we we're going to bring them back, but who's going to tell everybody else? Apparently, they were not eager to carry out the mission that would undo the previous actions and remove Elazar Ben Azaria from his position of Nasi. Isn't this exactly what his wife told him? His wife was right. His wife is right. Who, long, who knows how long you're going to have this job for? The launderer said to them, I will go. 
Rabbi Yoshua sent, the, sent to the sages to the study hall. The one who wears the uniform will continue to wear the uniform. Wow. The original Nazi will remain in his position so that the one who did not wear the uniform will not say to the one who wears the uniform, remove your uniform and I will wear it. Apparently the sages believed that the emissary was dispatched at the initiative of Rabban Gamliel and they ignored him. Rabbi Akiva said to the sages, lock the gates so that Rabban Gamliel's servants will not come and disturb the sages. I'm going to explain this in a second. As I know, we got to wrap up. When he heard what happened, Rabbi Yoshua said, it is best if I go to them. He came and knocked on the door. He said to them with a slight variation, one who sprinkles pure water on those who are ritually impure, the son of one who sprinkles shall water, water shall continue to sprinkle water. And it is inappropriate that he who is neither one who sprinkles nor the son of one who sprinkles will say to one who sprinkles, son of one who sprinkles, your water is cave water and not the running water required to purify one exposed to ritual impurity imparted by a corpse. And your asses are burnt ashes and not the ashes of a red heifer. Rabbi Akiva said to him, Rabbi Yoshua, have you been appeased? Everything we did was to defend your honor. If you have forgiven him, none of us is opposed. Early tomorrow, you and I will go to Rabban Gamliel's doorway and offer to restore him to his position of Nasi. So Rabbi Akiva, who they already passed over, right, because they said he doesn't have enough authority, is clearly in a big power position. Because Rabbi Akiva is the one who said, we're not doing anything here. Hold, the, hold it right now. Until we get to the bottom of this, we're not bringing Rabbi, Rabban Gamliel back. So let's make sure this is really happening. He says to Rabbi Yoshua, are you okay with this? Because we did this for you. We did this for your honor that we kicked him off the, off the, off the bench. So you're, gonna, you're okay with this? And he said, yeah. So he says it in a weird way. Rabbi Yoshua basically says, the guy deserves his job. He's from a long line of people who earned that job. Let him come back and do the job. He, he deserves it. He deserves it. And I feel appeased now. Like, yeah, I'm okay with this. Okay, this is the last part. I promise we're going to end with this. Um, this is the last paragraph. The question arose, what do we do with Rabbi Elazar? Elazar? What do we do with this guy? They said, what shall we do? Remove him from his position? That is inappropriate. As we learned a halakha through tradition, one elevates to a higher authority, a higher level of sanctity and does not downgrade. Well, they downgraded <laughs> Rabban Gamliel, but they elevated him. They're not, are they really going to downgrade him? He, he didn't do anything, Right. Therefore, one who is the Nasi of the Sanhedrin cannot be demoted. Well, they just demoted Rabban Gamliel, so that's not true. Let one sage lecture one week and the other sage one week. They will come to be jealous of one another, so they will be forced to appoint one as the acting head of the Sanhedrin. Rather, Rabban Gamliel will, let, will lecture three weeks, and Rabbi Elazar ben Azari will, let, will be the head of the yeshiva for one week. The arrangement was adopted, and that is the explanation of the exchange in, in Tracte Hagiga, says in the Talmud, whose week was it? It was, what, what, is it the week of Rabbi Elzar ben Azari? Yeah, okay, so we read in the Talmud that there was a tradition that Elzar ben Azari had a week, right? So they couldn't say, well, we'll go back and forth week, week by week because that would just cause chaos. Instead, Rabban Gamliel, because he was the original Nazi, we're going to give him the bulk of the job. He's from the, the family. His family, by the way, is going to come back into power. So this is, you know, we have to have the con continuity of Rabban Gamliel, but, but Rabbi Elzar ben Azariah was a Nasi, and we're not going to take him off of being a Nasi. We're just going to limit the amount of time he's on, he's on the bench. He'll be there for one week out of the month. The other three weeks, it's Rabban Gamliel. We brought him back. You did not expect that to happen. That's what happens. So it shows you that Judaism had a different take on, on forgiveness and a different take on how we reinstate people. Yeah. And you had to deal with that, right? You had to deal with that. And then here's the great kicker to this. One final detail. This goes back to what you said, John. It all started with a little discussion. That student who asked the original question that sparked the entire debate was Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai.
who becomes a very important rabbi in his own right. Do all the students rabbis? No, well, they eventually, well, yes. I mean, they all eventually become rabbis. But, um, I mean, that's the goal. I mean, some people washed out, so they didn't finish. But yes, at the end of the day, they become rabbis. The rabbi who started the whole problem, and they didn't forget it, John. They didn't forget it. When, so when you said, we got to go back four pages to see, I say, no, you're going to get to it, John. They're, they're not forgetting that the original question was, was said by a rabbi who becomes a very important rabbi in his own right, Shimon ben Yochai, who we'll talk about. He's actually the one whose yard site we celebrate, commemorate every year on, on Log Bomer. Um, he was a great you know, sage, but his, his, his uh, initial question that ended up causing this, this power struggle uh, was an important, ends up having an important distinction in his own day. And we'll read about him eventually. But so he's he's from one of the you know he's he's he becomes famous 40, 50 years later after this. He's he's just a student at this time. But they want to let us know that yeah, he's he has uh he has he had a, he started this thing, he started this whole power, this whole power struggle for well, it wasn't really a struggle, but the this whole impeachment process was started by Shimon Bar Yochai. So it's an interesting um it's an interesting, so many interesting layers to the story, but there's so many little treasures in here. And I think there's so, there, but the story, like there's a lesson upon a lesson upon a lesson. And when you like decompress it and you kind of like unpack it and you think about all the things that are there, like how many things just about, you know, like I take away obviously forgiveness, especially this time of year, you know, you, you have to, you, you know, that they were able to bring the guy back. It's just like, so amazing that that like that they could have that kind of compassion and that kind of um understanding that look the guy got the guy learned his lesson and and we don't you know there's no sense in continuing to punish him he can come back and maybe he'll be a good leader now uh now that he's that he's had some humility he's had some he's had some a chance to to understand what his colleagues are going through ones that are not wealthy like him but he's had a chance to understand that you know maybe maybe my maybe my maybe my standards were ridiculously high for for you know letting people into the academy in the first place all these things that he learns in this journey of him losing his power is is an amazing thing because you know normally again when someone screws up especially in our in our society we just write them off we say they're done they can never come back. They're they're finished. But maybe again, you know, somebody can come back. They've had a sense of humility, you know, a sense of of being humble and 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 had a sense of of greater understanding and greater, you know, that they have some wisdom now that they can um they can come back and be a good leader. Um yeah. I was just aware of that story of pointing out the whole importance of having a shared culture and a shared objective that's bigger than one person. Yeah, absolutely. He himself isn't what matters. Right? Yeah. His whole point was to study and to spread Torah. So if he wasn't the one leading it, that doesn't matter. Because if she, if people are going to do the same thing regardless if he was headed not, right? Whereas today in the, the worldly sense of it, it's all ego. And he wasn't wrong. Like we follow we follow Rabban Gamliel. It's not, Rabbi Yeshua was wrong. It was obligatory. He shouldn't have said that in the first place. He clearly, you know, Rabbi Yoshua was a little too tolerant. I mean, sometimes his tolerance is good. He let the Ammonite guy in, and the Talmud seems to say that he was right about that. But on the other hand, again, it's not about being right or wrong. It's about what kind of person you are. And Rabbi Yoshua definitely comes out as being one of the heroes of this story, because not only does he deal with the humiliation, but he forgives him. He has a chance, to, he had a chance when Rabbi Akiva says to him, are you appeased? And he says, yes. Yeah, I, I'm the one who's here to tell you to bring him back. He actually goes in and says, I want Rabbi Rabban Gamliel to come back. That that shows you, you know, that what kind of guy Yoshua, Yo, Rabbi Yoshua was. So, you know, the hero of the story in, in reality, of course, is Rabbi Yoshua. But Elzar Ben Azaria and his wife are also heroes of the story because it seems like, and we don't know, but Elzar Ben Azaria gets demoted and he and he you know look was he okay with working one day one week out of the month out of maybe but his his intention in the first place of taking the job knowing that he could get kicked out was hey 
at least I get to at least I get to be a leader in a little bit. So maybe he was okay with it. Maybe he said to himself, "Hey, I I share a job with Rabban Gamliel, but look, look, I get to be I get to be with Rabban Gamliel, who was a generation at least ahead of him." So he got to share the stage with a with a with one of the most distinguished people of of the of the time. So there's a lot in that to unpack, and there's a lot to learn from that. And I think that look, just negotiation and compromise, compromising. And Business, and the way to talk and, and the way to talk to people right the way the way to the way to treat people the way to to say things without offending them you know the way to kind of say it in a way that like okay you know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna beat you over the head with it i'm gonna <laughs> kind of tell you i'm gonna, t- I'm gonna tell you in a, in a nice way uh this that you know what to do and again you know raban gamliel starts the story with making the guy stand and in humiliating him with the guy not letting the guy sit down while you're teaching. Guy had to stand the whole time while he's teaching. I mean, that's like, you know, that's where he started from. And but the end, yeah, it sounds like uh, law school. It sounds like uh, the paper chase. The paper chase. <laughs> John Houseman. So I don't know. If, I don't know if that was your uh, your days in law school, John, or your school, your time, Philip, in law school. But uh, yeah, that was that was. Uh, those were great scenes. Yeah, of, of, of yeah, we 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 didn't have to stand. Good, good. Did they made you stand? No, no. And, no, and no. John says he had to stand. No, I was in an evening program uh, with adults, and there was no way we were going to stand for anyone, but. Um, even the day students, I had a class with day students at Loyola. Nobody had to stand, e- except in moot court, obviously. I, John saying his law school made him stand because it wasn't a good law school, but I don't uh, know. That was wasn't that supposed to be? Wasn't Paper Chase supposed to be Harvard or Princeton or something? Yeah, uh, uh, it was Harvard. Yeah. Yeah. So, I uh, I always thought I would go to law school, and then and then I realized that. That was not. It was not going to be my path. But the uh, the the people the people who who um, the people who went to law school. I think. I look at the part of the process of law school and part of the process of the bar is to weed out people who, you know, can't do the job. I mean, it, there, there's a there's a process to it, and that's, you know, it's. It, I respect it. I I I I have respect for that process. So, I respect people that have studied the law and have you know, passed the bar that have gone through the law school, been accepted and gone gone through law school and passed law school. That's, that's yeah, there, there, there's definitely an attrition rate. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. California has definitely got higher standards in some places, which is interesting, right? Because we don't seem to respect the law, but we respect lawyers <laughs> or we, we, we respect the process of becoming a lawyer. All right, everybody. Uh, it, we do have a very high standard in California. So you guys, Philip and and uh, and John and whoever else I don't know else who's uh, Lisa's a lawyer too. Lisa, did you did you pass the bar in California? Yes, I did. So there you go. So a lot of people that we respect who who went through that process. So thank you, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of of the week. We have Eat for TBA tomorrow night. And we have Shabbat services this Friday, and we also have uh, Shabbat services next Friday. Rick and Addie will be there both this Friday and next Friday. So hopefully we'll see you guys uh, in person or online, and uh, we'll keep you up to date with what's going on with the Dodgers too. Hopefully we'll have some more reporting and or at least uh, some more action that we can take. And, and they they lost tonight. Well, I saw Walker Bueller does, did not is not ready for prime time yet. I watched, yeah. that, I watched that first four innings of that game and were, I was not happy. But again, as John says, well, why am I still supporting them even? But whatever. All right, folks. Have a good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>